for Faye and welcome to my presentation on Ulster Scots language Ut and Boot. My name is David Hume. I'm a writer, a broadcaster, a local historian and I'm an Ulster Scot and uh, our family roots lie in the borders region of Scotland, uh, home of the famous riding clans um, or reavers or steel bonnets, uh, formidable inhabitants of the borders who um, came across to Ulster in the 17th century as well and you'll find lots of borders surnames in Fermanagh and Tyrone, names like Armstrong and Elliot and Graham for example. Um, one of the Reaver's surnames is Armstrong and one of the Armstrongs and is a descendant of the Fermanagh Armstrongs was the first man on the moon, the astronaut Neil Armstrong. Now accepting the moon you can trace the settlements of Scots and Ulster Scots in the landscape through the names that they give it. Personally, I think Neil Armstrong missed a trick there in not having some Scots or Ulster Scots names up on the moon, but there you have it. Uh, now, I'm going to be looking in this presentation at uh, Ulster Scots words and phrases in the landscape, but also uh, in the context of describing animals, people, weather, and much more. So I hope you're going to stay with me and you're going to enjoy the presentation. Now, when many Scots settlers arrived over in Ulster in the 17th century, they brought with them their customs, their culture, their way of life, and they also brought with them their language. And that language uh, still exists in Scotland. It's called Lallans, or Lowland Scots, and in Ulster, its correct term is Ullans. Uh, we know it more commonly as Ulster Scots. And Ullans is a, a language that goes back a long way. Um, it comes out of the Scots Lallans language and the Scots is a language that was used by uh, the, the great bard Robbie Burns in many of his poems. Um, still spoken today and called Lallans as I say and it's part of a West Germanic family of languages um, and, and other languages in that family include English, Dutch, uh, Flemish uh, and Frisian for example and German uh, of course. So uh, the Scots and Ulster Scots is descended uh, from that family, that ancestral family of languages if you like and uh, it's from the Northumbrian dialect of Anglo-Saxon that uh, it descends, that uh, dialect brought to um, the British Isles about 1500 years ago. So Ulster Scots and Scots come out of that Northumbrian uh, dialect. Uh, modern English is derived from the Mercian dialect of Anglo-Saxon. So uh, both English and Ulster Scots are cousins uh, of each other in terms of language but uh, they are not the same language, uh, they are related to each other and sometimes people uh, take the view that Ulster Scots is um, poor English effectively that if they hear pe people speaking in Ulster Scots then that um, they're not speaking proper English and it's not uh, it's not proper English and that of course has been a um, historical issue for Ulster Scots over the centuries when it has been seen and viewed as a, an uneducated language, as the language of uh, rural people, rural, uneducated, uh, ignorant uh, in the educational sense, people who uh, have not got the capacity to understand proper English. However, when we look at the situation, we see that English and Ulster Scots and English and Scots are separate. So therefore, uh, Ulster Scots is not just bad English. It is a separate entity of its own right. Um, and you can you can see that it's similar to English in many ways and I think that's where the misconception arises. But it is a very important language in its own right, has a, a culture and a heritage of its own uh, that I, I think is absolutely fantastic. And it over the centuries of course languages borrow from each other and uh, you find that that there's elements uh, of English Irish, Ulster Scots have all blended uh, in this uh, wonderful part of the world over the centuries. So uh, that's something that you can certainly see uh, when you look around.
But in this program, what I'm going to do is look at Ulster Scott's uh, words and phrases and descriptions for uh, the world around us, out and about, out and about in the landscape. The landscape itself, the animals, people, the weather, uh, those sort of things. So uh, let's get started on that. I'm from Ballycarrion, County Antrim, and some years ago I carried out a wee survey of my own into the uh, townland names around the, the village and the surrounding district. And I was, I was looking to see what uh, Ulster Scott's names existed. And interestingly, I found that there weren't so many Ulster Scott's names for the townlands. So they, were, they weren't there, which was rather surprising because this was a very, very strong Ulster Scots community. Um, I, I found some uh, Irish names and I also found some uh, Norman names going back to the 12th century as well. Uh, but uh, only one uh, Ulster Scots name in uh, one of the townlands, the townland of Kern Brock. And a Brock, of course, is a Scots word for a badger and an Irish word for a badger and uh, Kern is a, a word for a memorial, a stone memorial, like a stone Kern. So um, Kern Brock means the Kern of the Badger or the Kern of the Badgers. No trace of the Kern anymore in that landscape today um, but that's where the, the name originates um, and there's another um, element of that as well, just further uh, north and up in the glens of Antrim, uh, Kernalbana, um, which really relates to Kernalbanach, the uh, the Kern of the Scots, uh, or the Albanach. Um, and again, no, no real trace of that Kern either, but the landscape still carries the name, which is, is really interesting. Uh, so f for me, the interesting thing was that um, this uh, strong Scottish presence was not reflected in the townland names. But then I looked at a lower level, uh, just underneath the, the level of the townland names themselves, and what I found was that there's lots of names, of course, dotted across the landscape, which are uh, Scots names, or Ulster Scots names, uh, brought into to the area to describe the landscape. So that's really where um, the names were. Um, names like Bray, for example, um, and a Bray is just a, a small hill, as I'm sure you know. Uh, we, we have a Lady Bray at Ballycarry, there's a Gobbins Bray in Island McGee, uh, there's a Red Bray and Raw Bray within a, a proximity around us. Um, and if you go further afield, there is a town on Colt Bray up near Brookshane in County Antrim, for example, um, and a, a, a Bray town uh, near Ballymena as well. So um, that that's interesting because you start to look into the landscape and uh, you're looking to the old names and the problem is of course some of those old names doesn't matter whether it's Ulster Scots or uh, Irish or any other language some of those old names can get forgotten very easily in the modern world um, and it's, it's sad that that uh, happens or sad that that could be the case so it's very important to try and preserve uh, the local names what people describe uh, in their own area and uh, Bray would be, be one of those uh, one of those great names I think there are other brays as well. Belfast, uh, Liganil had the, the white bray, um, and uh, Ballysillen has uh, a Bray Hill, for example. Uh, Kirkwood's bray is now Old Ballysillen Road in Belfast. So you can see how uh, names are, are lost and changed then, as I said, uh, from that e example. And there's another word that's quite similar to bray, uh, which is the word uh, now, or no, uh, or nows. Um, and that just means a small rounded hill or a mound. Um, or the brow of a hill or a bray. Um, and, and, and you hear, if you listen to the traffic and travel news in Northern Ireland, uh, at some point you inevitably hear mention of the most uh, famous of those, which is Sandy Nows, um, because there's usually traffic congestion there, so it always gets a wee mention in the mornings and the evenings usually. Uh, but a no, that's what a now is, or a no, sometimes is also how it's pronounced uh, locally, just depending. Um, and also uh, a burn is a little stream, a wee river, uh, or a wee burn, uh, and it's a very commonplace name uh, in Ulster uh, landscapes. Um, and uh, there's, there's, if you go to Belfast, there's Purdy's Burn, there's Minnow Burn, um, there's Tilly's Burn, there's Red Burn, uh, and uh, in our area there's a, a quite a famous uh, burn called the Mutton Burn. Um, and there, it's actually it's so good they named it twice, I always say, because it's called the Mutton Burn Stream. So um, burn, 
means a stream, uh, but uh, it's the mutton, bur mutton burn burn effectively if you look at it that way, or the mutton uh, mutton stream stream. <laughs> so uh, it was made quite famous in the 1930s uh, by my grandfather William James Hume, who wrote a, a, a song about it called the Mutton Burn Stream, and it was recorded in a, a film called The Early Bird, in 1936. It's one of the first uh, uh, feature films made in Northern Ireland. And uh, that that give it a considerable prominence, and it's been recorded a few times in more more recent years as well, uh, too. So it's quite a, a a famous wee burn as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, um, there's another one called the Misty Burn up near um, Ballymena too, um, and there's a poem about it uh, called the Lass of the Misty Burn. Uh, so near where the the Mutton Burn flows down to the sea, it drops down to Belfast Loch, uh, is a little area called the Cassie. And it runs up a hill, up over a brow of a hill, or a brew of a hill. Um, and a cassie is, can be a laneway, uh, but it also can be a causeway. And sometimes it's a, a term given to the area behind a farmhouse, uh, the cassie of the farm as well. So uh, it's not a very uh, common name nowadays. It's uh, rare that you would find it in the landscape, but uh, certainly a relic of uh, a few centuries past. Uh, and still in use uh, in the old place. So there are, as we have noted, burns at many, many different locations. There's not too far you'll travel around without finding a wee burn, somewhere in the countryside, somewhere in the landscape. And a raw would be a name for a street or a road uh, in Ulster Scots, but a bray, of course, is if you get to a steeper part of the road then, that's what becomes a bray and you can see the height of some of these uh, hills, hill roads when you go around. Uh, hence they get that name. This is a Lady Bray uh, just outside Ballycarry where I am from. And you can see it's quite an incline there. But another name which is uh, used in the roads uh, can be Lonan. Uh, usually it's more on private land, a Lonan or a laneway up to a farm. But this is the Tongue Lonan near Carrick Fergus uh, which is a, a standard road. Uh, I say more often uh, it's used, it's a, also called a loney uh, as well as a lonan and sometimes it's named after individuals, a person that lives there or a family that lives there as well. So you can see this is a, a good example of a, of a lonan. And this is another example of a lonan or a loney here but it also is interesting because of these walls because it has a particular name, it's called the Owl Waz and uh, Waz is a name of course for just old walls. Uh, in Ulster Scots, and these are particularly old limestone walls, probably going back to the 17th century, uh, it's believed locally. Uh, so they get the name the old walls, and in the old days people used to gather here for conversation in the evenings. There's a place named in Island McGee in County Antrim, which manages to incorporate both Irish and Sc Ulster Scots. And it's called Todd's Rodden, and a Rodden is a Scots and an Irish word for an unpaved roadway, uh, so a roadway across fields uh, or a roadway that's just not paved in any way, perhaps formed as a pad by animals. Uh, you know that cows, when they're out in the fields, they sometimes follow the same uh, pad along the field, so it eventually makes a little path that's always there for them. Um, so uh, that's what a rodden is, and there's a few uh, roddens about in terms of place names, uh, and, and even uh, there's a street name in Larn uh, called the Roddens, which is definitely paved nowadays, uh, but it was a pathway for cows to go up into fields before there were lots of houses there. Um, but Todd's rodden then is an interesting one because Todd is an Ulster Scots word for a fox, and it's used in uh, Lallans then by Robert Burns, um, by James Hogg, who's called the Ettrick Shepherd, another uh, significant Scottish poet, and also by the novelist Sir Walter Scott. Uh, so Todd's a, a, a good word for a fox, and uh, it has survived in County Antrim then, uh, coming across with, with some of the families that came from the west coast of Scotland. And the reason it's called Todd's Rodden is that uh, at one particular time in the uh, 19th century, the uh, earlier section of the 19th century, before the 1850s, a, a fox had appeared, and foxes were not as common in that area at that time, but this fox appeared and it was uh, causing havoc on the local farms. So the farmers decided to hunt the fox, go after the fox and uh, finish uh, his uh, activities at night on the farms. 
And a number of times uh, dogs were set after the fox and what happened was that the dogs would end up going over the cliffs of the goblins uh, and got dashed uh, on the rocks below and uh, nobody could figure out what had happened. One of the local men, a name, man named McKean, he kept an eye to this area where the fox sort of disappeared when it went up to the cliff top and he saw the fox coming down on one occasion. It used a little branch of a wind bush uh, or something similar to swing down. It had its lair just under the top of the cliff so it was able to swing down and then it was able to scramble back up again when it wanted to. So whenever the dogs were chasing the fox, the fox grabbed the branch and swung itself down. And the dogs just went straight out into the, the open air and down to their deaths in the rocks below. So um, this man, McKean, he decided to sort things out and he uh, went and cut the branch. So the next time the fox was being chased, unfortunately for the fox, uh, there was no branch there to catch on to and it went right over the edge then at that point. But the name has survived in the landscape even if the fox didn't and Todd's Rodden is a, a really good reminder of language uh, in terms of animals and in terms of uh, the landscape as well uh, this idea that the fox created the path so it was the fox's path that is, is commemorated at Todd's Rodden uh, so I think it's a fantastic uh, name to, to have survived and another uh, name in Island McGee which is Ulster Scots is the word Isle uh, and Isle is used to denote an island uh, but not an island that's necessarily surrounded by water so it could be a, a an elevated area in a field or fields it could be described as an island um, and there's quite a number there's one the Isle of Muck in Island McGee is actually shown on maps as being inland whereas Muck Island just to confuse things uh, it's just off Port Muck and just off the coast and Muck Island, uh, the word Muck is the Irish word for pig uh, and it could also be Scots Gaelic and uh, people assume that it's to do with the pig that we would uh, have on land but uh, there is another possibility that the, uh, the, the Scots Gaelic word for uh, porpoise certainly is equivalent to sea pigs so you can see porpoise off Muck Island and off Port Muck quite regularly uh, out in the sea and that's possibly where that name came from but Isle of Muck relates to an area inland which is not surrounded by water but could be surrounded by marshy areas or simply higher up than the other uh, elements of the, of the landscape and there's quite a number of those uh, that can be discovered when you look at old, old place names and so on. And there's other commonplace names that you'll find in the landscape that are from Ulster Scots. Uh, Plantons, uh, Planton is a, an area of, of trees um, usually deciduous trees are referred to as a plantain. Um, you also have uh, the name Feel, uh, F-I-E-L is uh, a name for a field so again uh, Ulster Scots tends to be economical with letters so the D is dropped from the, the word field uh, so it's not pronounced as field it's just pronounced as feel. Um, so lots of farms uh, all the fields would have had individual names in the past um, and I've seen studies in Grey Abbey in County Down for example of uh, a lot of the field names there uh, and, and uh, similarly in my own area I know I, I did a little survey on, on our own farm of the field names that we had um, in the past we had uh, the dam field, quarry field, the big field, the low fields, uh, front field and the calves field and so on and all, all those sort of names tend to get lost because farms uh, become bigger and bigger and fields are subsumed and uh, much larger fields are made uh, so the old names uh, tend to go so those those s sort of names are particularly under threat in the landscape uh, because they're very personalized names to individual families often and to individual farms uh, but field names are significant because they can tell you a lot about the, the landscape as well and also I think the the term March uh, would be used commonly certainly in our area in relation uh, to farms, to boundaries of far farms or firms as they would be called uh, by the older people in the countryside and the Merch uh, Ditch was the boundary or the Merch Dick Dyke was the boundary between uh, particular farms uh, it, it might go back to the uh, period when the Scots uh, particularly those in the borders of Scotland would be familiar with the idea of Merches uh, because there were uh, three Merches, there was the Western Western March is the Middle March and the East March um, and so different families were associated with different areas uh, but those marches were quite distinctive and I think that that larger geographical term 
for the march uh, or the merch um, uh, and both on the Scottish border side and the English border side may have come across with the settlements in the 17th century and, and is, is projected down the way to relate to specific farmsteads then, specific farms. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting one, it's a nice one I think uh, to think of, of where uh, these these uh, titles, these words originate and how they managed to survive uh, over the, the centuries. Um, and in, in my own case, uh, a particular uh, name that survived uh, on our farm was the word squaw, uh, an area referred to as the squaws, uh, which, uh, or the squaw field, in fact, it was referred to, but it's hardly a field, it's quite a small area. Um, and it contained three uh, lint dams which were used uh, when they were growing flax. Uh, on the farm and the lint dams of course were full of water so it was always a place when you were a child you were told not to go near it because it was dangerous uh, and because of all that water and uh, just the sides of it were all overgrown with grass and so on so it was a kind of a dangerous place to go near it was needs to say it was fenced off uh, so you weren't supposed to be anywhere near it um, for, for me it sounded very exotic at that time growing up the, the idea of squaws it sounded like something from the, the American West um, and in later years, when I tried to find out about it, I discovered that um, an Ulster Scots language rule had applied here to this this word. Because I tried to find squaws in dictionaries and Scottish dictionaries and Ulster Scots dictionaries. And there's a dictionary for County Antrim Ulster Scots as well. And it didn't appear in any of those uh, as SQUA. Um, but I, I was reading in uh, a, a grammar of Ulster Scots diction uh, of Ulster Scots diction and language. And it uh, it related to how the fact that Ulster Scots uh, does drop letters like talked about D being dropped from field there also drops the G from ing at the end of a word too uh, from time to time and uh, it can also add letters then uh, to to the front of words so uh, it's quite common in in um, in Scotland uh, and indeed in, in parts of Ulster where there's Ulster Scots for someone who's uh, called Hugh. To be referred to as shoe or shoey, um, and that's where I found the clue to what this word actually meant on the landscape, uh, because an s had been added to it, um, and the real word was qua, as in qua, and uh, qua was in the County Antrim Ulster Scots Dictionary because it's a word for a a marshy area or a wet area, and it probably comes out of quagmire, um, so qua is the correct term for it, but Ulster Scots had put a, an S on it and made it squaw and made it very difficult to understand what it was. But when you look at the landscape, you understand because the reason the lint dams were in that particular area was because there's a lot of streams, a lot of springs coming down there uh, and a lot of water on the surface then and it's a, quite a wet area. And of course, all that water then is absorbed into these uh, lint dams and uh, that's how they, they came to be there. So it made a lot of sense once you understood uh, the, the word and where that word was coming from. Um, so for me that was a really interesting landscape one and it was almost a forgotten word because uh, I don't. Th I think if I hadn't found uh, out the meaning of that word uh, it would have just disappeared probably in another 10 years I wouldn't have, have remembered about it. It would have gone and um, we wouldn't have known. So it's, it's one of my little uh, treasures that I've managed to identify. Now for those of you that were eagle-eared there you might just have heard the barking of a wee dog, and that's our wee dog down the stairs. Um, and the, he's a very alert wee dog, and he keeps us all aware. If there's anybody moving anywhere near the house, then you get a few barks like that. So uh, I, I'm going to be talking about animals and, and words for animals uh, fairly soon. So we sort of preempted that a wee bit, and I'm not just ready to go there. But um, another word that I think comes into to play with him, um, he's a wee Yorkshire Terrier, by the way, um, is the word Caleri, because sometimes I think he's a wee bit Caleri, the way he carries on, to be quite honest with you. And Caleri is a great Ulster Scots word, it's a very descriptive word. For somebody who's a wee bit silly, uh, or light-headed, or a bit uh, giddy, we would say, um, they're described as being Caleri, or in, in fact, they could be described as being clean Caleri, in fact, um, if they're way off the scale. Uh, so Caleri is a good word, and there's a wee place uh, in Island McGee used to be called Caleri, Toon because the people there obviously were regarded as being quite giddy. Now Caleri Toon was at the end of a drover road. They used to take cattle uh, across 
uh, to Scotland and the, the Drover trails came down to the east uh, coast of Antrim needless to say so it was at the end of one of these Drover roads that they took the cattle across uh, to Galloway to the, the markets and Galloway and elsewhere um, and um, it had a little uh, inn or a shebeen or something of some sort so that may have accounted for people getting a bit giddy at the end of the Drover road and at the end of a Drover trail um, and then being referred to as Killaryton but it was a little settlement of its own it was up a wee uh, area called Sally Keynes Lonan so you remember I talked earlier about laneways and lonans and how they might be named after individuals so Sally Keynes Lonan was where Killary Town uh, was at and uh, it even had a wee school at one time but uh, if anybody had asked you where you were from I don't think you'd have said I'm from Killaryton it might have given them the wrong impression now I'm going to end this little section on uh, Ulster Scott's language in the landscape with a little poem which was written some years ago by a gentleman called Forsyth Gregg and uh, Forsyth has passed on a few years now but um, he wrote a few things in Ulster Scots and he was very familiar as he, he was growing up um, around the area around Glenow, a little village just um, west of where I live. Uh, he was aware of all the words and the language that was used and um, how people described things and, and he put it all down in this little poem uh, which is really interesting uh, because of the use of, of the place names and the language. And the area that Forsyth Greg uh, was writing about is called the Leisure and it's just a name for the, the local area. It's a, quite a windy road. It comes down beside the uh, the river right down towards the shore. Uh, so he called his poem The Leisure and he refers, you'll hear some of the Ulster Scots words being used here in, in describing the countryside. So The Leisure by Forsyth Gregg. Up the leisure, ruin the branch and by the crooked row, the old stick brig at Glenford, Gats Grun and Sweet Glenow, the Bally Hone and Miss Mary's Lonan, the Glenow Waterfall, Glen Bray, Glenow Bray, Carneal Bray and Awe, the Glen Bray Heads and Craig and Boy, the lovely Glenow Valley Road that taxi ye to Bell Toy, Craig and E and Craig and Orn, the Paith Foot and Machra Morn, the Raw Bray, the Blah Hole, and Gay Senior up at the Barn, and the Rocky Enver River Road, Wayne and Dune to Larn. So that's the leisure and I think it's just great that somebody sits down and records those sort of names and places uh, because uh, if they don't do that then they can very easily be lost and uh, we all know how easily that happens uh, and uh, certainly in rural communities we're very keen to, to retain what we have and it's passed down through the generations in terms of place names so I, I think that's a great wee poem because I, I know all those places and to me it just encapsulates the whole landscape in that little verse. And this is the self same noisy boy. A wee dog or a wee doggy in Ulster Scots. Could of course be a big dog or a big doggy, just depending. And the collective name for cattle on the farm was Kai. Uh, there's a great wee poem by a man called Charlie Gillen called When All the Kai Had Names about how farms were small and uh, the livestock numbers were small too, so they were all given names by the farmers, something that's not prevalent in the modern world any more as farms have increased in size. Also on many Ulster Scots farms there were sheep and the Ulster Scots word for a ewe was a yo or a yo and uh, Professor Montgomery in the United States has traced the word yo to the Appalachian Mountains and to Alabama uh, where settlers of course from this part of the world would have gone. Also, a lamy or a wee lamy was a reference to uh, a lamb among the flock. And the Ulster Scots had their own words for our feathered friends as well. So many birds have names that uh, we're very familiar with in English, but they also have Ulster Scots equivalents. Uh, so I'm just going to mention a few of them as, as we go through here including some seabirds. The puffin was referred to by Ulster Scots as the cutter neb or cutter neb. Um, a neb is a word for a nose and the word cutter may have come from the Ulster Scots word for the coulter blade of a horse-drawn plough. Um, they were also called Ailsa parrots because of their colourful bills. And they do nest in County Andrum at Rathen Island and the Gobbins and Island McGee. 
These are kittiwakes, which are also found in the coast, and they're referred to as chittiwinkles in Ulster Scots. The razor bill is a bird that's referred to as a bridal neb, supposedly because of white markings on a large nose like bill uh, of this bird resemble the shape of a horse's uh, bridle. And there's lots of other names uh, for birds as well. A uh, cormorant is called a skirt. A crow is just a craw. Um, a raven is called a corby. Um, and a guillemot is a cutty. Uh, so lots of different uh, names for all these different birds. <coughs> and there's also names for lots of different types of plants and vegetation that you would find uh, dotted around the countryside. Um, on the, the seaside there's a plant called sea campion which uh, is referred to as witch's thimbles um, and also you have uh, different plants in that are, are more common in the uh, inland as well too so um, wild fuchsia which would be quite prevalent in many areas is called uh, hennysickle. Uh, Breers is a reference to brambles and ones is of course uh, gorse or also called whin uh, bushes too and in terms of the seafaring tradition a lot of Ulster Scots on the coast of Antrim and Down were seafarers so they would have had their own names for a lot of the fish uh, and so on and um, the, the word herring was abbreviated in Ulster Scots so they didn't talk about herring they talked about hern uh, and in fact um, dolphins which are sometimes off the coast as well were referred to as hern hogs because they uh, followed the herring and uh, you could identify where the shoals of herring were if you watched where the hern hogs and the dolphins were uh, were heading to as well. Uh, a few of my favourite words uh, from the natural world that Ulster Scots have uh, are Gaelic and a Gaelic is a, a nearywig uh, uh, and a puddock is a toad or a frog so a puddock still is a toadstool um, and so um, you can have uh, words that then describe those uh, definitive words uh, sometimes diminutive words as well. So uh, always, we're, we're very big on the word we in this part of the world. So you could have a wee puddock uh, or a slicket wee gillock um, or a wee puddock still. And you can have a wee lamy, of course, as we talked about earlier too. So lots of different words for lots of different things. Um, and of course, one thing that we never stop talking about over here is the weather. So there's lots of different Ulster Scots terms uh, for the weather as well. Many of our words to describe the weather are about bad weather. So drukit is a very, very wet day. A drich day is wet, grey, misty. And the one is the wind. Sometimes you might get a thunder plump, and that's thunder and rain. And of course, you don't want sna. You tend to get it in the winter as well. So we've looked there at the weather. We've looked at animals and birds. and We've looked at Ulster Scott's uh, names in the landscape. And before I go, I'm just going to look at some descriptive terms for others around us, for people around us as well, um, because there's some fantastic terms that Ulster Scots have uh, for those as well. Um, some of them you may be familiar with, maybe maybe not. So um, I think one of the most fantastic ones is if somebody's not feeling very well at all, they're described as being peely wally. <laughs> it's a fantastic term. Um, so uh, it probably comes, it derives from the word peel, probably originally. Uh, that's where the, the peely comes from. But uh, if they're feeling really under the weather, they're very peely wally. That's a, a good old Ulster Scots term uh, for that. And um, somebody could be funthered, they could be foundered or funthered. Uh, means they're very, very cold, so they've been out in bad weather uh, for that situation to happen as well too. But there's other folk as well. We talked about um, the word caleri. So somebody might be caleri. If you, if you think they're, they're just a bit daft and giddy about things, then they'd be described as uh, a bit caleri. Um, and sometimes a caleri person may be more prone than most to let out a cackle or a cackle out of them. And a cackle or a cackle is just a, it's a, a loud, uh, repetitive laugh. Uh, it always reminds me of the idea of the, the witches in Macbeth around their cauldron, cackling and getting on. Um, I could just see that happening, you know, so that's a great Ulster Scots word, cackle or cackle. Um, and um, there's other words then, uh, if somebody's seen as being a bit uh, underhand and sneaky, then this word would probably apply to them, sleek it, sleek it. 
and uh, I have a friend and when he was at school he once uh, wrote an essay on one of the Roman emperors and he was told off for writing in the essay in Ulster Scots that he thought the emperor was a sleek at wee body uh, so he didn't have a good high opinion of the emperor but uh, the, the teacher didn't have a high opinion of him either and uh, that sort of uh, is one of the things that happened in schools that uh, people who came from uh, Ulster Scots speaking communities were uh, told to, to get proper English on the page or speak proper English uh, and there wasn't really much of an understanding back then of, of how this was a language in its own right that had come down and was, was held by, by folk uh, down through the generations. So sleek it's a great wee word as well too. Um, Burns refers to that in terms of the mouse, doesn't he? Sleek it wee timorous beastie. Um, so it's got a, a, it's a very powerful word. It's got a, a power of meaning behind it there, I think, too. Um, and there's other words as well then. Um, gurn, if somebody's a gurn, they're always complaining. They're very hard to please. They're always whinging about different things. Um, if somebody's pernickety, then um, they're usually very hard to please. And often it's referred to in the context of food. They're very hard to please uh, in that sense. Um, there's also a great word, nitter. If somebody's a bit of a nitter, they're a person who's uh, niggling and complaining all the time, nittering on. Um, and um, and I, one, one phrase then you might use in terms of that, in terms of Ulster Scots, a sentence might be, uh, I am sick, sore and tired of your endless nittering. <laughs> another another word in Ulster Scots is crabbit. Um, I don't know if you've have uh, come across anybody that's crabbit before, but uh, crabbit is a word for somebody that's very bad tempered and irritable. Um, and uh, and in the Ulster Scots song, there's a song called "Wee Maggie Picken," um, and it, it refers in one of the verses. It says, "Maggie Picken had a wee and thran crabbit bean." Swore she'd never do that again, Maggie Pickens, Ian Wayne. Um, so, <laughs> two words coming in there. Crabbit, of course, is the one we've mentioned. And then another great word, Thran. Thran's a brilliant word in Ulster Scots. And it just, it means um, stubborn and headstrong. Um, and uh, it's alluded to in that verse from Maggie Pickens. But there's a thrangness uh, sometimes described about people. Some people are described as being very thran. Uh, and that just means they'll, they're stubborn. They're not... Uh, not give in to something, they'll just uh, be quite stubborn about it and uh, they won't change their mind, they'll just be thran about the whole thing and as awkward as they can. And there you are. <laughs> you might know something like that, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, um, also, uh, a word that's not used very much now in Ulster Scots but was prevalent before was falore. Um, and again, it's a good Scots word. It's some, somebody who is a bit of a falore is a bit of a vain person. Um, they're very showy. They're not very, uh, they're usually quite harmless, but a bit showy and vain. So they have a bit of falore uh, about them as well, too. So those are just some uh, words. Of course, there's specific words for uh, children are referred to as weans. Uh, Wean, dear, it's time for your tea. Um, or Wayne dear, you'll hate to come in the house, time for bed. Uh, so Wayne's good Ulster Scots word, good Scots word for, for children. It probably derives from Wayne's, uh, and then it's uh, abbreviated into Wayne's. Uh, that's, I would say that's how it's, how it's originated. Uh, a young girl can be refer refer referred to as a cutty in Ulster Scots. So a cutty is a young girl. A young boy is a loon. Uh, a loon is a, a turn of phrase for a young fella. Um, and um, other terms then, a wee girl might be called a wee hizzy, a wee hizzy and uh, a wee fella might be called a wee laddie. And uh, you've, you've heard the term lad. Uh, so again, it's that IE that we talked about uh, in Ulster Scots is, is used uh, to uh, add the diminutive form to a word. So laddie has uh, got that in it. Um, and that's a, a, a term for a young fella or a young boy. And another term is lawn boy. You might just say lawn boy, lawn boy so and so. I know lawn boy so and so. Um, or lawn boy over lawner is another way of putting it. Uh, so there's different terms and different ways to describe things. Um, I like the word lawner. I think it's a great new word. And um, thonder, thonder is another way of, of spelling it, but it's usually thonder. We, we tend to drop the D in Ulster Scots. We don't use it if we can uh, avoid it. comes uh, silent. In a lot of these words. So um, those are some of the words I just had a wee note of I was going to mention to you. Um, but there's there's other great words too and one of the one of the, the uh, 
nice words I think about Ulster Scots in terms of the landscape and the world around us is the word Daligan. Um and uh, you can you can understand what it means when you think about it, the component parts of it, Daligan, Day Ligan. So um it just means that uh, dusk is coming. Uh, the day is almost gone, it's getting dark, um and Daligan is the time of light when time of night sorry, Daligan's the time of night when the light has uh, all but gone. But it's a great wee word uh, rather than sunset or uh, evening time. I, I like that wee word, Daligan. Uh, uh, it's, it's not used very much now in Ulster Scots, but you find it now and again. And um, a few people have, have written it in their poems and so on, Ulster Scots poets. So it helps to, to preserve it. Fantastic wee word. So um, I hope you've, you've enjoyed uh, this, this program and I hope you've got something from it. Uh, it's been nice to just have a wee dander around the, the landscape and talk about different things, um, the, the creatures that inhabit it, the, the, uh, some of the, the wildlife that we have and some of the landmarks that we have and how we describe them in, in Ulster Scots. So um, I hope you have enjoyed as I say and I thank you for, for staying with me and hope to see you soon. Bye.